Long ago, a young Mi'kmaq woman fell into a deep sleep and dreamed of the rocks on the shore and the ocean beyond, the sea restless and the spray nipping at her feet. Beyond the fog in the distance, she could see one island, and the island was moving. Such tricks of the eye were well known, so she focused on it, if only to prove herself wrong. However, the island moved closer and became more clear to her view. The island appeared to be draped in white rabbit skins. And as it moved closer, she could see trees beneath the rabbit skins holding them up. Once the island moved very near to her, she could see bears scurrying around. At last, when the island moved quite close, she realized they were not bears at all, but men draped in furs, with thick beards crowning their faces, thicker than on any man she had ever known. She awoke quite early, with sweat pouring down her body and her limbs trembling. Dreams could mean many things. One of those things is foretelling of the future. Being unable to make sense of her own dream, she sought out elders and medicine men, those who worked with spirits, but could never find anyone who could interpret the dream. In the entire collected past of her people, no one had an experience that could relate to the future just on the horizon. Welcome to Season 2 of the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Although New France would become this continent-spanning empire, going from the northern fringes of what is now Canada all the way down to New Orleans and Louisiana, the initial stages of New France and the majority of the actual French population would be huddled around the St. Lawrence. If you don't already know, the St. Lawrence River is a massive body of water that gets really wide towards its end where it dumps out into the Atlantic Ocean. And the St. Lawrence is actually where all the Great Lakes eventually send their overflow of excess water. And so if you look down the east coast of the United States, of Canada, of the continent as a whole, there are very few ways to naturally pierce the inside of the North American continent. We have these mountain ranges going straight up the side of it. And if you follow these chains of mountains far enough north so that they diminish in size, eventually you get to a part of the continent that's far too frigid, far too cold. And the riverways up there are frozen a good chunk of the year. And while the St. Lawrence does freeze over in the winter, it is the best entry point to get to the middle of the continent. I would give second place to the Hudson River, which featured prominently in season one. Now the Dutch were mostly on the Hudson, at least early on, for the fur trade. Guess what? The French were up in the St. Lawrence way before the Dutch, and they were there for the fur. And that brings us to the topic of this very first episode. Because without the native population there to provide those furs, the French would have no use for New France and no possible way to make it economically viable. And the other reason why we're starting with the natives along the St. Lawrence is that in the entire history of New France, it always contained more natives than French people. And at the very end of the series on New France, you will see, once the natives decided, I'm not going to help the French anymore, New France crumbled. So let's get to know some of these native groups as they could best be reconstructed culturally, geographically, linguistically, just before the Europeans show up. All right, let's start the furthest upstream where the St. Lawrence is fed by Lake Ontario. Today, on the one side, you have the top of New York State. And on the other side, you have Canada, both the province of Quebec and Ontario. This will be the first group that the French get to know on any sort of intimate level. And yet they're the most mysterious, because today we're not even sure what to call them. We just call them by this blank geographic term, the St. Lawrence Iroquois. What? Did I just blow your mind? What is this group of Iroquois that we're talking about? I thought we were talking about that last season. Who are these people? And that's just the thing. Although we meet this group super early on and have a few interactions, they disappear. There's going to be a point in this season where they vanish. 
but we know from these scant records that they spoke an Iroquoian language. Now, just to review from last season, Iroquoian languages cover more than just the people in the five nations, in the Iroquois Confederacy, now the six nations. It covers people as far away as the Cherokee, who are part of the southern Iroquoian branch, and then the Huron, and then a bunch of other groups that were eventually assimilated by the Iroquois Confederacy. Now, the St. Lawrence Iroquois might have been one of these groups. Scholars have speculated, well, maybe this group was the Mohawk before we meet them a century later. Maybe they lived up there. There are myths among the Mohawk and the Algonquian people that the Mohawk did live up there. And then other scholars go, well, you know, they seem closer to the Huron, who are another Iroquoian people who live out among the Great Lakes. But archaeologists have come to realize that the St. Lawrence Iroquois have been there a very long time. That they were, in fact, their own Iroquois group. They weren't just a group that ended up somewhere else later on. They were completely their own thing. And by the few descriptions that we have, they live very similar lives to the people inside of their linguistic group. They're going to use longhouses, have palisades around their villages. They're going to have massive cornfields. They're going to rely a lot on agriculture. Men are going to do hunting. Based on the accounts by Jacques Cartier, there seems to be internal political conflicts within villages where you have different factions, and that might imply clans, and you're going to have male chiefs, and we have very little record of the women and what their role was in St. Lawrence Iroquois society. But I believe this would only indicate that they're further similar to these other Iroquois groups that we know a lot about, because the women were typically the power behind the scenes, they were in charge of the central village, and the men were in charge of hunting, defense, and foreign relations, basically. So the fact that we really didn't get to see St. Lawrence Iroquois women means that they probably had similar systems to the Iroquois Confederacy and the Huron. According to Darren Bonaparte, who runs the wonderful Wampum Chronicles website, check it out, he says that among the Akwesasne Mohawk, there is a tradition, or a legend rather, that the St. Lawrence Iroquois had a confederacy of their own. So rather than small clans, bands, tribes, villages, they were united in a confederacy much like the Huron or the Six Nations. And the accounts of Jacques Cartier would suggest that the several villages that he came into contact with had some sort of relation with one another. And so they very well might have been in a confederacy together. Now, culturally, like I said, they're very close to their Iroquois brothers and sisters, cousins, neighbors. And so if you want to know more about them on a village level, on an experiential level, go back to season one and watch the culture episode for the Iroquois Confederacy. Because I'm finding in my research that if you look at the different Iroquoian groups who lived in the Great Lakes or who lived in what is now New York State, as long as they're in that northern group, they have this underlying layer of similarity. And so if you listen to that episode, you'll get a good feel for these people. And we'll see them as soon as Jacques Cartier shows up to explore the area. But that brings us to some new native tribes. Tribes we haven't never discussed on this show. Far different than the Iroquois-speaking people. We're going to get to the Algonquin or the Algonquian people who have a language, a whole bunch of languages. They're, they're a whole language family all their own. And it covers a huge chunk of North America. I, I believe they're the largest Native American language group in geographic size. Just massive. And the Algonquian languages are not related to the Iroquois languages. There's no overlap whatsoever at their very root, although they might share some language based on their proximity to one another. The two Algonquian-speaking people that I want to focus on the most in this entire season of the podcast will be the Innu and the Mi'kmaq. Now, these two groups, they're going to straddle the St. Lawrence at certain times, and in modern terms, they're going to straddle the borders between the United States and Canada. Now, in the United States, we tend to use the term Native American. At least social studies teachers do, although other terms are becoming more preferred in certain circles. In Canada, they often use the term First Nations. So I might use either term, or I just might say the word native, because it's pretty much all-encompassing. Either way, you know who I'm talking about. So these two groups, in their spiritual and religious life, share some general similarities to their Iroquois-speaking neighbors, and especially to their Algonquin or Algonquian relatives and distant relatives. And these will be things that you'll typically hear about Native American spirituality. First of all, the Native Americans before the Columbian age 
were animists. They believed in spirits, and that spirits occupy human beings. You have a spirit. Animals have their own individual spirits. Plants will have their spirits. But so will streams and bodies of water and mountains and the sky and the clouds and the moon and the stars. And part of Native American spiritual to this day is believing in those spirits. And that's part of the reason why Native Americans uh, currently are so involved in the environmental movements of the world. Because everything around you is a living, feeling being. And so at the base of every Native American religion or spiritual system north of Mexico, you see this animist layer. To communicate with the spirit world or to individual spirits, you would often use prayer in the form of dancing and singing and the smoking of tobacco or the smudging of tobacco where you take tobacco that's been rolled up and you rub it on your body or you might light it and perform a ceremony with it. Tobacco is the method of communication and at the same time a little bit of an offering up to these spirits. There's often the notion of a great spirit, some god, to use a western word, that created the universe and will have ultimate power if it chooses to ever use it. And different tribes have different theories on whether or not you can contact the great spirit directly. We'll see some tribes believe, yes, you can have a tobacco offering, you can do a smudging ceremony, or you can do a dance and a song over a ceremonial fire, and you can commune directly with the great spirit itself. Where there are other tribes that believe you have to use shamans, medicine men, wise old folks, or another less powerful spirit that's more on your level to communicate through, to get to the great spirit, or to any very powerful spirit, that is. But these are things we often hear about all Native American or First Nation religions. We hear about spirits inside of things. We hear about the animistic elements. But there's so much more going on. In fact, it was common among the natives of the Northeast to reserve winter time to tell stories. Because then you could talk about the spirits and they wouldn't necessarily hear you during the cold and dull days of winter time. And the Innu and the Mi'kmaq especially told fantastic stories that were on par with the, the ancient legends of the Norse or the ancient Greeks. They had tales of immortal lands and giant rock beings and thunder beings. They feared powerful women who would become wives of spirits and so would be the closest to the European version of a witch. They would have archetypes. They would have trickster spirits, powerful demigod-like beings who were overwhelmingly good in nature, but sometimes got bored and decided to mess with people. And sometimes these spirits would come seek you out without your permission in your sleep. Much like the story we started this show with. All right, that was a short overview of commonalities in Native American religion in general, and specifically uh, among the Algonquian people. The, well, the people who spoke Algonquin languages or Algonquian languages. And again, this language family is huge and it's very old. Uh, think about this. Uh, English is related to German, right? It's also related to Russian. It's related to Greek. It's related to languages as far away as in India, right? Hindi. Now, all the Algonquian languages, they're quite different from one another. So some of them, you could kind of understand what was going on between them. But other ones were completely different. Imagine you, an English speaker, I imagine, being dropped in Russia right now there'd be some confusion. Same thing with all these Algonquin folks. They can't necessarily understand one another. And so the first Algonquian people we're going to look at is the Innu, who I've already mentioned. Now, the Innu's territory overlapped with the St. Lawrence Iroquois, and it's probable they didn't get along very often. But the Innu especially were highly mobile and semi-nomadic. And so during the times of year when the St. Lawrence Iroquois would go down to the rivers and streams in order to collect seafood and fish, the Innu would actually be preparing to go up into the country to go hunting. And so the two groups had an unspoken rhythm about them that kept them out of the most severe trouble. And how far up country would they go? Well, they are classified as a sub-Arctic people, meaning if you go north of them, you're hitting the Inuit and the people who live like the Inuit. And so the Innu, in their traditional territory, before all the Europeans showed up, lived at the St. Lawrence, 
and then square north. And then to the west of them, there were a couple groups of other Native American tribes who were close enough in relation to them that they could actually speak to one another in their native tongues and there would be mutual intelligibility, which means they could understand each other. And so an Innu could make their way from the east coast of the United States and be able to understand somebody as far west as basically take the Dakotas in the United States and go square north a little ways until you get a fair bit into Canada, right about there. So the middle of the continent. Now this long linguistic reach will be important to the Innu later on when the French are looking for furs and the Innu are like, hey, we're highly mobile and I can talk to people for 1,500 miles west of me. So I'm your middleman. And by north of the Dakotas, I mean pretty much Alberta, Canada. Despite their geographic location, the Innu saw themselves as pretty much the center of humanity, as every tribe or people did back then, and maybe some groups of people do today, uh, their, their name simply meant people in their own language. So Innu meant people in Innu. <laughs> um, while this is true of a lot of different groups, a lot of different groups, their name in their own language will mean people or true people or real people or the good people. It's, uh, it's extremely common. The Innu endure these long winters and they travel huge distances and they go long periods of time without eating food. And then they have very short periods of time where they gorge themselves with food at these massive feasts. Again, the climate that they lived in was just a little bit warmer than the Arctic lands that you would expect to see from uh, Nunavut or the Inuit or any of these Arctic groups. So much of their life really was centered around survival. Important to the future of the Innu is that they already had a tradition with trading with the Iroquoian-speaking people uh, further to their south and the southwest. Now, what would they have to trade if they're mainly hunters and gatherers? Well, other native groups didn't need fur at the time, not like the Europeans would need shortly after this point in time. However, the Innu hunting over winter in the far north would hunt these huge elk, these huge moose, and they would produce these wonderful one-piece hides. Now imagine, this is a world before plastics. This is a world where anything that's waterproof or water-resistant is extremely useful. And so you have a group like the Huron, who are busy just growing tons and tons and tons of corn, because they're pretty much, uh, they're pretty much sedentary, except when they want to go out hunting or, you know, to go off to war. And so they're just growing tons of corn. They got to find ways to store this corn. They got to find ways to waterproof their floors and their, and their, and the ceilings of their longhouses and the roofs and whatnot. And sometimes one solid piece of skin, like from the hide of a moose, would be a godsend. And so only these rugged subarctic groups that were ranging over the vast area of what we now call Northern Canada would be able to provide it from the largest moose they could possibly find from the coldest areas. And so when the Columbian Exchange happens and the old world and the, and the new world combine, they co collide with one another and a new world order begins, they're going to have a place, the Innu. They're going to have a place in this new system because they already know how to get furs. They're going to have to switch from hunting large animals to small animals like beaver. And they already have a trade network set up, both with people that they can communicate in nearly their own language and then these Iroquois people. And so they have the skills to fit into the world that's just going to emerge. And they have the contacts to keep that trade going out to the Atlantic Ocean. Now the Innu, much like many Algonquian people, were far more patriarchal than many of the Iroquois people, who tended to be very matriarchal. So among the Algonquins, we find there are some matriarchies, some patriarchies, but they aren't so skewed towards a matriarchy as the Iroquois. The Innu, they of course had councils of men, and these men would make decisions, and these would be chiefs who were selected by bands and villages. Now when a new chief was selected, he assumed the, the name of the old chief, and with that name, with that title all rolled up into one, came whatever responsibilities that name was supposed to uphold. And so you have this uh, idea of reciprocity. It's a very John Lockean idea. 
or a very Spider-Man idea. With power comes responsibility. And as long as you hold up those responsibilities, you will keep that power. And so an Inu chief held his title by persuasion, by being a provider, by being confident, by being strong. And overall, these chiefs and any councils they held didn't have an overbearing amount of power on the Inu people. And one of the big reasons for that is because of the winter time. Because how the Inu lived their summer and their winter was drastically different. And depending on the conditions, in winter time, leadership could go completely out of the window. So before we get to the cold, dreary winter, let's talk about the summertime. The Inu would literally split up their year into two seasons. They don't have the typical four that uh, many of us follow. They believed in the, pretty much the spring summer as one season and the fall winter as a different season. And they actually thought of them as supernatural beings competing with one another, revolving around one another. And reflecting that, their lifestyle was just completely flip-flop from the one season to the second season. So the Inu had territories between their bands. And if you wanted to pass through one territory to get somewhere else, you'd have to provide some sort of tribute. And this is common among Native American tribes. If I'm coming through your territory, first of all, you better let me know you're there. You better not let me find you by surprise. And you better have some sort of gift to offer me. Now, if you want a first account example of this, you can go to last season of the Other States of America History podcast and listen to the uh, primary source into Mohawk country. Now, in that account, we see a Dutch guy show up in a Mohawk village And the Mohawk chief is like, what, you don't have anything to give me? What is wrong with you? Because it was such a rude thing to do in their culture. The Dutchman had no idea. He thought he was traveling. Meanwhile, the Mohawk chief was like, this is, this is rude. This, who are you? Who do you think you are? And the Mohawk would complain constantly about them, how the Mohawk simply didn't seem to have any manners. Similarly, the Innu required gifts. You're passing through my land. Give me something for it. And these territories were most well-defined during the summer months. In the winter, there's some evidence that everything just went out the window. But during the summer, there were fairly well-defined territories that had been established for a very long time. And different bands would come together and they would set up summer camps or villages. And they would live in what you would call wigwams, which some people find offensive now. And I got to look into that because I just used it. But other people call them wiki-ups. And they would use other structures that were somewhat similar to longhouses. Or sometimes they were just big, round, longhouse-like structures that were very wide. And these camps would be set up along a shoreline. So you're close to the water source for disposing of things and for drinking water and washing yourself. But also, and this is a thing that many uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, historians are starting to realize, that the Innu were a hunter-gatherer group. And we've used that term for a very long time. But hunter-gatherer kind of covers up the fact that most of these groups relied heavily on seafood, on fish, on any, anything in the water, basically. Think about it. If you were a hunter-gatherer, it's far easier to grab something out of the water than to go hunt something with four legs that could run really fast and has a thick hide on it that you got pierced through, and teeth and fangs or claws or hooves and antlers. Fish. Just go, go get a fish. Go get something in a little shell over there. Grab a lobster. And so the Innu, during their summer season, ate a lot of seafood. The men, of course, would be responsible for hunting. And the women, oddly enough, it's not recorded that they had any tradition of agriculture. Although some scholars recently are starting to question that notion, whether it was just not present or they had a very inconspicuous form of agriculture or just a way of tending to the plants that are edible already found in the wild. The Innu would use these wonderful birch bark canoes. And if you saw one, you'd go, oh, I've seen that a million times. The French fur traders would adopt these things. They're incredibly light. So think of a canoe or a kayak or something that's made out of wood today. A a wooden one is heavy, right? But a thin birch bark canoe would be more like a thin aluminum canoe. So if you do any sort of boating, you know that for somehow, some reason, a thin aluminum boat is quite light even compared to a plastic or a nice wooden boat. And so the Innu used these really thin, delicate, light canoes, but they could hold hundreds and hundreds of pounds, in some cases, thousands of pounds. And they were very easy to navigate 
along the busy and rough waterways of the St. Lawrence and the places further upstream. And the French in the future will find these boats far superior to their own clunky contraptions. And some say if it were not for this little birch canoe, we wouldn't get New France at all. As nearly all of the furs making their way back to France are going to be at one point or another transferred via birch bark canoe. But again, this was during the summer. I don't want you to think they lived this idyllic life in a paradise. They lived in a rough environment and they had to work hard every day, every month, every year to keep themselves alive and thriving. As such, they lacked some of the creature comforts found in the groups just south of them. Which is, again, is another reason why the Jesuits were like, eh, I don't think I'm the guy to convert this group. I'm gonna go head down there with the people with the nice bunks and the furs and everything like that. The Innu didn't have pottery. Being highly mobile, they really had no use for these heavy, clunky, uh, very breakable uh, clay pots that other groups further to the south that were more sedentary could use to store things or even to very carefully cook things in. The Innu had no time for such things. And so that just demonstrates the roughness of life this far north, where pottery was too much of a luxury for their nomadic lifestyle. And as the summer wore on and turned into fall, the Innu would go to the shores of the St. Lawrence, and they would start their fall eel harvest. Now, they would capture eel by the thousands, and they would smoke it over a fire and make a sort of fish jerky out of it, a staple they could pack away protein-rich, calorie-rich, dense food that they could take with them on the dangerous journey that they experienced during the winter time. And as fall turned into winter, these summer camps that would consist of 30 families, sometimes more, would break up into smaller and smaller sections as the food became more and more scarce. And so eventually, a winter group might be traveling around, uh, and it would only consist of two or three families. And by families, we mean uh, pretty close to a nuclear family. And in the deep heart of winter, we're not talking about extended clans. Like, literally, this is my kids, this is my husband, this is my, you know, parents, this is her parents, maybe this is her brother. That's about it. It's basically who's coming over to Thanksgiving. So three or four of those, that would be your winter group. And these wiki-ups would be located all over the place, and the Innu would be constantly rebuilding them. And because it was wintertime and people were traveling around and everyone was just looking to get a bite to eat, territories were relaxed. Because even the chiefs, at certain times, would become hungry. And they'd be taking care of their small family, and they couldn't be too concerned about territorial disputes, you know, 10 miles away or even 100 miles away. And so every group just kind of folded in on itself, split up into smaller bands, and would regroup uh, come their summer season. Of course, the Innu were experts at making snowshoes, which makes it oh so easier to walk on snow than trudging through feet of it, which I have to do every year as I'm shoveling because I refuse to get a snowblower. And even in the very coldest time of the year, the Innu had certain rocks they could spark together in a flint and steel technique and start fires. This is extremely hard to do. I've tried doing flint and steel fires because I used to uh, I used to actually work at a Cub Scout camp and I would teach fire building and things like that. Flint and steel is hard, especially when you don't have pre-made materials to light on fire, like a nice dry ball of cotton that's at room temperature. Imagine, imagine forging out in the depths of winter for things that are frozen to then spark over and catch on fire. These people were hardy, they were proud of it, and they knew it. For example, they had a reputation for never wearing a hat. No matter how cold it got, they wouldn't wear hats. Now, of course, that can't possibly always be true, but that's the reputation they gained in certain circles throughout history. These small circular winter habitations would have low roofs and a central fire. And about 10 people could sleep in these. They'd be huddled up together in a circle like a donut around the fireplace. And the fire, even though there was a small hole at the top, if it was cold enough out that you really needed to pack the wood on the fire, the place would start to fill up with smoke. And so everyone would lay down and get as close to the ground as you could, just so you could get some air. Now this was the most important time of the year, to be a good hunter, or be with a good hunter. Because the eel jerky is going to dry up. 
any provision you had, eventually, as you're nearing the middle of winter, the end of winter, all the easy pickings are gone. There's nothing to forage. You need to hunt live game. And the hunters would leave early in the morning. They'd leave burning bundles near their habitations as a way of knowing how to get back, just in case they got lost. They could see the smoke. They could smell the smoke. But they'd be traveling over vast distances to look for large game, something where they could kill one big thing and eat for a very long time. Later, the Innu would become experts at hunting beaver, for instance. But a beaver is about one meal for your family. You hunt an elk or a moose, you're eating for a while. And so they were going after monsters. But even the best hunters, and sometimes because of the best hunters, a territory will be dried out of game. And then it is time to pack up camp. There's usually somebody in the group who has an idea of where there might be better hunting grounds. That person would go ahead and mark trees as he went, while everybody else, especially the women, packed up the camp. Now they had certain wiki-ups, wigwams, that you could remove the poles from, pack up, and put on a long sled. Now a long sled is just what it sounds like. It's a narrow sled, but it's very long. So you can push it through the snow easily, but you can carry a lot on it, including all the poles that you would need to construct a habitation anew when you get to your new location. So they would pack up camp, and slowly in a long trail, they would all head out. At the same time, when they found a new location, the women would start assembling the camp, while the men would immediately start going looking for food, because that was the most important thing to get a hold of. This time of traveling and trying to find new territory well, was the most dangerous time. Because if nothing happened, you would just starve to death. And if anything happened, you could be killed. And so sometimes they would have to forge streams that were half frozen. Sometimes they still have their birch bark canoes and they would have to avoid ice flows. Other times, the Innu were known to have traveled by ice flow or hopped over them while pulling sleds, while holding up in the air their birch bark canoes, or while having their backpacks, which were strapped around their heads, fastened to them knowing full well what would happen if they slipped and fell into the icy waters below. These were courageous people, and they had to be, because things could get very dark very quickly at this point. Now let's say that the food wasn't in the new location. Well, this small band of two or three families might split up into individual families, and might split up into individuals. And then, of course, in the summer, people would recollect and sometimes it would completely throw the order of things out of balance. So certain chiefs ended up in different areas. Certain groups just were completely made anew, uh, considering who starved to death over the winter time and who moved into an area to join a pre-existing group. And so this created a lot of fluidity between all the different Innu bands and basically tribes. And so that over time, the Innu occupied a large area but there was relative peace between them because membership was highly fluid and they exchanged people. And much to their credit, people were exchanged voluntarily. People just ended up in different groups depending on the choices they made over winter and where they ended up and who they got along with and who they didn't get along with. And so you had a lot of individual freedom in the Innu world. The price, of course, is that the Innu dealt with famine far more neighbors to the south. But in some ways, this made the relationships between people all the more precious. And on a more guttural level, it just made food all the more enjoyable, considering the scarcity of it. And so when food was plentiful and the hunt went well, the Innu would hold these epic feasts on a Romanesque level that might happen over several stages over many days. Usually they were to celebrate special moments in life, birth a death, war, peace, marriage, the big events that we still celebrate today. Or when it comes to war and death, you know, recognize, honor. Often the host of the feast was a man who hunted the beast that would be the centerpiece of the feast. I know that's hard to say it <laughs> 10 times fast. And the host would pick and choose who among him, all men, by the way, invited to these feasts, who among him would get what part of the animal, the fattiest parts of the animal, were the most highly prized. Of course, because they taste delicious, but also because they're calorie-dense foods living in this cold environment. And the fat could be drained off and stored and used for various ointments and applications on the skin. Bear's grease and bear fat being the most desired, of course. 
And if you managed to kill a bear, it was such a high honor that you brought all the men you know out to the spot where the killing happened and you recounted the tale. When you killed a carnivore, you hunted a hunter. As host, somebody, without it ever being spoken, would set aside a plate for you. You were supposed to divvy out the food to everybody else, determine who gets what, but you were to take nothing for yourself. Meanwhile, a good friend of yours would be saving up bits and pieces so that you may eat after everyone else does. And of course, the sources are divided. Like I said, many of these feasts are noted for being primarily dominated by men. But there are some references to feasts that had women and children. And there are some other references that say, well, the men-only feasts, all the men took home like a doggy bag for their family, for their children and the women in their life. Now, both accounts are probably true, and there's probably some feasts that only men could go to. And then there are other feasts where anyone could show up. In many cultures, ceremonies involving wishing yourself good luck or, or gaining some sort of spiritual power in order to go to war or to go on a successful hunt often involved excluding women. I don't know why. I didn't make it up. Don't blame me. But in many cultures, they were excluded in those types of activities. And so perhaps the Innu, and this is pure speculation, perhaps the Innu had male-only war feasts and big hunt feasts, whereas the other occasions in their lives would be inclusive of everyone. But that's my best guess, and take with it what you will. Sometimes at these feasts, they would construct large shelters, and inside they would smoke massive amounts of tobacco, and they would share the tobacco with one another. In many Native American cultures, especially along the East Coast and inland a little bit, tobacco is the first thing you give out to a friendly visitor. And smoking tobacco with someone, that was a way of opening up negotiations or, or friendly uh, terms of negotiations. And remember, tobacco, smoking it, lighting it on fire, smudging it on your body, was a way of communing with spirits. And so it was a sort of way of drawing in and connecting with other people, but also bringing the spiritual world into your meeting so that whomever can take witness, making your words all the more important and any agreements you make binding. All right, let's leave the male-centered feasts and go back home. What is the family life like? What are the gender rules? How are children treated in traditional Innu life? Although many of the governing forms appear to be patriarchal, families were matriarchal, especially in terms of which clan you belong to. Marriages could be polygamous, at least for the men. They could have many wives, and this was a way of keeping peace between separate bands of Innu. Also as true for many Native American tribes, the men lived very dangerous lives. The ones who lived were very brave, and many of the ones who died were very brave but the mortality was far higher than it was for women. And so there tended to be a deficit of men. But as I mentioned earlier, the matriarchy wasn't as strong among the Innu as the Iroquois people. And so marriages were more easily left. In the Iroquois tradition, there was a process where you had to go through your respective mother-in-laws. And there, was, there were steps you had to go through in order to initiate a divorce. Whereas with the Innu, it's an individual choice. There was more individual freedom. If a couple didn't want to be together any longer, they simply went their separate ways. And as has become apparent, the Innu had defined gender roles. All right, Today, we don't like to think of certain things as being only what a man can do or only what a woman could do. But in many cultures in the past, there was a clear division. The Innu were no exception. And these were gender role lines that you just couldn't cross. For example, the most desirable men in Innu culture were the good hunters because they provided food to feed everybody and keep everybody alive. And if you were an Innu man and you wanted to do something that wasn't hunting, wasn't providing food, and what they might have considered something that a woman would do, well, women wouldn't find you very desirable because life at this time is food, water, shelter. And if you can't provide food, it would be me just deciding not to work anymore. My wife, after a while, would get upset with me. Now, this, of course, is wrapped up in the Anu analogy to gender, but it didn't necessarily have to be. You have a husband who needs to hunt to feed his family. He decides he doesn't like hunting and he wants to do some other labor 
that is more associated with women. Well, now you're not bringing in food. You're not doing what you promised to do once you married the woman. And so you're likely to end up getting a Innu divorce. And it wasn't that the Innu women would see them as feminine, but it's recorded that they would describe men who didn't like to hunt as lazy or dependent on others. And so while there is a gender division there, it more has to do with uh, your utility to actually do work. And I'm harping on this husband-wife thing because the nuclear family was far more important among the Innu than the Iroquois pre-contact uh, in pre-Columbian uh, days. The Iroquois had larger extended families and clans. There was a whole other layer in place. Among the Innu, like we talked about, in wintertime, it might get narrowed down to just your family, your core family. And so a lot of your mental energy went into making sure your spouse was okay, making sure that you had lots of kids, that your kids were strong, and that your kids could help provide, and that your parents were okay. Your sphere of influence was smaller, and the, and the, the depth to which you could care about people around you a little more narrow, focused on just the people close to you. Much like the exclusion from feasts, when women were menstruating, they had a separate dwelling that they lived in. Because the men believed what was going on there was bad luck or some sort of cyclical illness. And again, you can find this in many different cultures around the world. Menstruation is a mysterious thing, especially to men. And you might laugh and you might say, oh, how ignorant were they? Blah, 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 blah. But I guarantee you know a guy who has trouble going to the store and going to the uh, women's aisle to pick something up for, for his wife. I guarantee you know a guy who's uncomfortable doing that. So don't shake your head at it, because you're still living in that world. Now here's a very modern concept among the Innu. They didn't really use corporal punishment on their children. The Europeans noted in situations where they would beat their child, the Innu would talk to their child, or wouldn't beat them at all, or would use some other method to reason with their child. So while you might scoff at some of their notions of gender, their ideas on marriage, divorce, rearing children were extremely modern. Among the earliest accounts of the Innu from Europeans, mostly French Jesuits, they had a reputation for being very quiet people. And they would often go through large portions of the day going through routines without speaking to one another. Even when entering and exiting a building, they wouldn't make small talk. It wasn't required of them. You don't have to make an excuse just for showing up somewhere. People just accepted that you were there. And it's also recorded among the Jesuits, that the young men in the family would talk amongst themselves. And the old men in the family, they would talk to each other. But the two groups didn't have a lot of interaction with one another. The young men greatly respected the old men. And when the old men did speak to them, they meant business. And the young men, of course, would listen to them. Now, in a culture where there's so little talking, what words you do say are more impactful. Again, like I said earlier, they save their stories for the, the deep heart of the winter, when the spirits aren't listening. And ending our discussion on the inner family life of the Innu. When one member of your family died, mourning occurred for years. And if your spouse died, you would mourn for literally, uh, the best estimates are three years, about three years. If you wanted to remarry in that time, you would have to go to your dead spouse's family, your in-laws, as we would say today, and ask for permission to remarry. But other than that exception, you were supposed to tear your clothes, blacken your face, bring your hair down. You were supposed to physically show that you were in mourning for an extremely long period of time. And with the discussion of death comes the discussion of war. What was war like among the Innu before the Europeans showed up? It's believed that a lot of their warfare involved blood feuds. As we've talked about on the show before, and it literally happens everywhere in the world, blood feuds. You kill someone who's precious to me, I will kill someone who's precious to you in return. But that's not the end of it, of course. It's a blood feud. Because now I killed someone over there, and they're going to want to kill one of my people in return. It's the Hatfield and McCoys. It's literally Romeo and Juliet happens all over the place. And in a world where eye-for-eye eye justice is unregulated, individual, and in competition with no other system. It runs rampant. There are blood feuds constantly. And among the Innu, there was a gift-giving procedure. And so if you killed somebody, you could make a gift of a determined amount between the two parties 
perhaps two clans or two nuclear families to forgive, to be forgiven rather, for the murder. You'll see examples of this in French records sometimes. Often, there'll be a case where a native of some culture, not necessarily the Innu, killed a Frenchman. And then the native tribe wants to make a gift to compensate for the loss of the Frenchman. But the French system, they want to go through uh, trials in, in systems that you'd be more familiar with today. They want court cases. They want to call witnesses. They're, they want there to be some sort of verdict. And that'll be a continual source of friction between those two groups for the entire history of New France. Now, if the gift giving failed and we have strings of blood feuds, this could go on for years. And the only way to finally put this thing to bed would be a decisive war. A war between clans or the, a war between the Innu and another people that would put the matter to rest completely. Now, for example, this doesn't mean the Innu are going to completely wipe out another group and thus end the struggle between them, although that stuff happened all the time all over the world, but it simply meant a decisive win. And so, let's say one group of people manages to win one or two battles, burn one or two villages to the ground. When you're talking about political entities that are on the scale of U.S. states or smaller, burning two or three settlements to the ground would be a decisive win. And if you could manage to do that, the other side would usually sue for peace and the matter would be resolved. As the Iroquois do, the hatchet would be buried and all the previous grievances would be settled there and then. And you start over with a clean slate, which of course would be quickly uh, dirtied, thrown upon, drawn upon, whatever you do with slate, it would be quickly ruined. And the Innu are one of the prime suspects as to what happened to the St. Lawrence Iroquois. And so to try to reconstruct the St. Lawrence alliance system, it seems like the Innu were at times allies with the St. Lawrence Iroquois, although not all the time. It looks like the Innu were also allied with the Abenaki, another Algonquian group. Meanwhile, the Huron, deep in the Great Lakes area, were probably enemies with the St. Lawrence Iroquois, whom at one time it was thought they were two different groups. It looks like there was some warfare between them. And also the St. Lawrence Iroquois often went to war with the Mi'kmaq. I believe I'm saying that right. I'll work on my pronunciation. But it's the group we're going to look at shortly after this. The Innu, much like the Iroquois to the south among the five nations, would construct huge wooden shields when they went to war, covering as much of their body as possible. And they'd crouch behind it. It was like a Roman centurion. Big shields, bigger than a, than a Greek, Greek hoplite would have. Large, rectangular deal that you could just put your whole body behind. Think of a, a police riot squad and the big plexiglass shields that they have. That's exactly what we're talking about. That kind of mechanism, that kind of shape, design. And in a time where you don't have gunpowder and you're fighting with flint and wood and bone and rock, a nice heavy wooden shield would be like a suit of armor or it'd be like covering yourself in bulletproof vests. It worked out pretty well for you. Now, when the Europeans show up, uh, one of the first groups that the Innu want to go attack with the European help are the Five Nations. And they go down to what is now Lake Champlain or Lake George, one or the other. I'm forgetting right now. Doesn't matter where. They're really close to each other. And both sides essentially had that same setup where they were covering themselves with wooden armor. Because again, short of the Europeans showing up, that was pretty good protection for the time. Wooden armor or shields, rather. All right, now we're getting to the nitty gritty stuff that people don't always like to hear about. But captives were taken in war. And the Innu are recorded as saying, well, the Iroquois take our captives and torture them, so we're going to just torture them too. So they put the blame on the Iroquois for why they torture their captives. And among the Innu, it seems as though the women were really the prime perpetrators of torture. So when an Innu group would be coming back with Iroquois captives, it's recorded that some of the women would even bribe Iroquois warriors to make sure that they got their pick. They got the one that they wanted. And when they were brought back to camp, the women who lost husbands on this military expedition or whatever encounter caused this expedition in the first place, they would get their first pick usually. And they would pick their captive. And while any women and children would typically be adopted by the Innu, the men had a very different fate. 
And so a woman who lost her husband, she would get her, she would get her captive male, and her and her family would slowly torture him to death by burning parts of him, uh, stabbing tortures. The kids would usually do that. They would slowly cut off appendages, and in some cases force the victim to eat parts of his own body. This, of course, would be done as slowly as possible, or at least until the perpetrators got bored, and then the person, of course, eventually would die. As awful as it may seem, go anywhere in the world during the 14th or 15th century, you're going to see this level of torture, whether it's done by individuals or groups of people or governments, it's going to exist back then. And so that's just a reality you have to live with. And so now for an awkward segue, let's move on to the Innu religion. Of course, they had that general layer we talked about earlier, where uh, they were animists and everything around them had spirits that could be communed with. Some of the most important of these spirits on a day-to-day -day level are the spirits they call their grandmothers or grandfathers in the Innu language. These were the animal masters. And if you please them, or if you communicated with them in such a way that they found uh, enough there to give favor on to you, they would make the animals show up in abundance. And they would make them easier to kill. So as important as it was for a woman to have male family members who would be willing to hunt for her and the rest of the family, it was important that the spirits above were in a good enough mood to let those animals be out in front where the men could hunt them. And there was a sort of spiritual power attained when a man hunted an animal. That animal had an energy about it. Its spirit, of course, moves on, but there was an energy to it that made it living. And the man absorbed that energy by killing the animal. Also, women would gain energy by processing the dead animal. And so the elderly were well-respected because they were thought to have absorbed so much of this energy. They were on the same level as a shaman, as a medicine man. Just by making it to a very old age, they had attained a spiritual wisdom about them. The elderly also slept more. So, of course, they received more information through their dreams, which could be visions of the future or messages from powerful spirits. And so they were more spiritual in that way. And then there's one other way, which I'm going to bring up in a little bit, and I have to put in its own section because it's funny, but it's also a touchy subject. So these spirits, these grandmothers and grandfathers, they come from a realm where the Innu originally came from. Think of the different worlds that the Norse had. They come from a completely different earth, so to speak. And on this earth, everything is larger and more powerful. And the Innu cannot go back to this place because everything is dangerous there. Everything is just too big. Everything is just far too extreme in its proportions. And human beings would be like ants, crushed just by the wind. Now, this realm is also inhabited by spirits on the same level as the grandmothers and grandfathers and of the same substance, same quality. They're the same type of mythical being, but they're evil and they don't like human beings. And it's only through the actions of the grandfathers and the grandmothers and the fact that they help separate humans from this realm they can no longer return to and place them on this earth that they are saved from these evil spirits who can still leak their influence into the world around us today. Another reason why words are important in the Innu religion, and in many religions, uh, even some today, words have power. And so your words can place a curse on someone, especially if you are a powerful medicine man or a shaman of some sort. Your words could actually be listened to by a spirit, and bad things could happen. Curses could be made. And oftentimes when the Innu uh, felt sick, they had some sort of disease, or they were on their deathbeds, they would think that someone else who didn't like them put this curse upon them. And so the shamans would be called in to convene with the spirits above and find a way to cast off those curses. They would have sweat lodges. And through the sweating and the praying and the singing, they would hope that a cure would come to them. They practice bleeding cures, which the Europeans did, of course, commonly right up through the 19th century. And so this manipulation of sweat and blood, which many cultures try to uh, wrangle with, it's the idea that your body has certain liquids in them. And when those liquids are out of balance, out of proportion, you become sick. The ancient Greeks had this belief in it, and they came up with the idea of the four humors. And perhaps if you weren't sick, but your small family was on the point of starvation, 
in the middle of winter, during the darkest, coldest parts. They'd make campfires, and they would drum, and they would sing out to the heavens, praying to whatever spirit might be around to bring some animals to them. And if that didn't work, they would turn to the bones of animals. And they would heat these bones and observe the cracks in them. Many students would recognize this tradition from ancient China, where they would similarly use oracle bones, as they called them, to find out things about the future. For the Innu, the cracks in the bones would give them direction on what to find, where to go, and what to hunt, and when to do it. And these bones would be carefully handled and treated with respect, because it was believed that the animal masters, the grandfathers and the grandmothers, would use the bones to restock the animal populations. And another awkward segue, perhaps the most awkwardest, I don't know if that's a word. Let's get on to a uh, particular spirit of the Innu. The name of this great being is Machishkapu. And I believe I'm saying that right. And I mean this with all respect, because things are going to get a little silly right now. Because this spirit is most literally translated as Fart Man. Yes, you heard me right. He is the Fart God, or Fart Man. And he's referred to as the Spirit of the Anus. Just to let you know, I got this information from a single source. And all the clickbait articles about this god, or spirit, comes from a single source put out by Peter Armitage in the 80s, I believe. He's a Canadian researcher. He writes like an anthropologist, so that I'm assuming that's what he is. And even in his source, he says, Hey, guys, I looked back through the history, and I don't see anybody else writing about this. So, here it is. And so I immediately thought, well, the, the Innu, who we interviewed, were messing with him. But there are Innu sites, official Innu sites, that source this article by Peter Armitage as a reference material for people to use. And so, clearly, uh, they're endorsing of his work. Now, let's get back to the discussion of Fartman. Yes, Fartman is funny to the Innu. He's a point of discussion. But he's also very powerful. Because essentially, he controls the back end of every human being, of every spirit, and of every animal. Now, if you had the ability to control the exit of a living creature, you have some level of control over them, don't you? And so he's actually one of the more powerful spirits among the Innu pantheon of beings. And unlike most of the other spirits, some of which we're going to talk about after this, he could communicate directly to people through the sound that came through the, the through farting. He could communicate to you through farting. Of course, the message would be garbled, and people would sit around and discuss the meaning of those messages. Now, not all farts were messages from Fart Man, but especially if you were alone or out on the hunt, somewhere isolated, somewhere where you could hear clearly and be in privacy and not have other people interrupting, those were taken to be certain messages that you would interpret for yourself. And while many of the memes and clickbait on Fartman claim that uh, Fartman was their main god, uh, it, there's really not enough evidence to say that. There's literally one source. And that one source claims he's a powerful spirit, but not a creator god of any sort. He's not the great spirit, and other spirits certainly have powers and abilities of their own. And so that's Fartman. Take with it what you will. And now we're going to move on to the Shaking Tents Rites. So this is a very particular thing among the Innu that Europeans especially have taken a lot of interest in. Now in Innu spirituality, the really powerful spirits, other than Fartman, couldn't be communed with directly. You might be able to get a message out to them through your own private ceremonies, but getting messages back came through dreams, or you had to use a shaman and get an oracle through bones, or what they call the shaking tent rites. A small tent would be constructed. Let's say you had an issue. You wanted to find out where there would be a good hunt, perhaps. You would have a shaman enter the tent. You would not do it yourself, because you wouldn't have the level of spiritual power in order to uh, evoke the spirits and then endure the environment they create. The shaman would drum and sing and shake the tent when the spirits finally decided to descend and join the ceremony in communing with the shaman. Now, the shaman could ask for a good hunt, 
uh, could be asking to throw off curses, could be asking for cures. A shaman could, even through these spiritual connections, ask to speak to another group of Inu far away. After the tent started to shake, there might be animal noises from inside, and that was the spirits coming down. Now, shaman could only communicate with certain grandfathers and grandmothers, and then those spirits could contact the animal masters themselves. So there were a lot of intermediaries along the process here. Once the tents started shaking, the Innu believed that the environment became very dangerous. You, you wouldn't want to enter the tent at that point. The spiritual power that you had wouldn't be enough to sustain the merging of this spiritual world with this corporeal world, the world you see around you. Lots of religions have this idea. Think of the ancient uh, Israelites and the man who ac accidentally touches the Ark of the Covenant. Or the wear and tear Moses uh, endures by climbing the mountain and speaking to God himself, coming back down and being weathered and old. In many religions, the spirits or the creator God, the great spirit, is so fantastic, so powerful, so uh, terrible in its scale that you coming face to face with it just destroys your physical mortal shell. And for the Innu, the only people that could come close to this would be those with lots of spiritual power, like their shamans. And so we spoke of the animal world. We spoke of fart man. We spoke of different ways of communing with spirits, the different spirits that existed. And we talked about different ways of receiving messages from them. Dreams, sweat lodges, burnt bones. And now at the end of our spiritual discussion, we will discuss death in the afterlife. Now there are varying accounts on how the Innu treated their elderly who were in a terminal state. There are some references to them abandoning the elderly. There are some references for them caring for the elderly to such an extent that they're pulling around the infirmed on sleds for years at a time. And there are also accounts of mercy killings. Euthanasia to put the old and in pain out of their misery. Ultimately, you can't really determine were the Innu good to their elderly, were they bad to their elderly? Well, first, what is good and bad? Secondly, why are the Innu one monolithic group? Maybe this guy over here is good to his elderly. Maybe this guy over here is terrible. We can't make a generalization. But these are the differing accounts of what happened. In some cases, they will take the elderly wherever they go hold them by sled as long as they can and sustain that person for as long as they could possibly live. In other cases, you have, you know, you have crummy kids and they abandon you. Or in some other case, you're in such pain, you're put out of your misery. What's more interesting to me is what they believed happened after death. Again, when someone close to you died, you covered yourself in paint, you grew your hair long, you let everyone know around you that you were suffering from the death of a loved one. They would take their dead and bury them in a crouching position facing the west. It was believed that their spirit had to go in that direction to reach the land of the dead or the village of the dead. The spirit would have to leave on foot and both live in this world and in a spirit world. They would have to sustain themselves. They would have to eat by hunting the spirits of dead animals. And they would have to forge the rivers and climb the mountains, make it through the dense forests. It was a journey that no living man could ever endure. And they would pass through mythical lands that were so far away from the Innu that they became legends. They believed in a land far to the west, before the land of the dead, where time slowed down everywhere else. They, they actually had an idea of relativity. You would enter a land where you could spend a day there, and it would be a year back at home. And so time was starting to break down. And then you would go further and further west until you finally entered the village of the dead. Once at this village, your spirit had a life about it. Even though you were dead, you could now live again as you did when you were alive. You could fall in love. You could meet people. You could get married. You could even have children. And these children would not be sent into the living world where you couldn't see them. They'd stay with you in this village. And so humanity moved from this world of titans that was too dangerous for us to the earth that we know now. That is wonderful, but we have enemies, we get sick, and we die. And then finally, they move to this third realm where they can live much as they did on earth, but not have to worry about the specter of death. 
and never be separated from their loved ones. And so with a morbid but happy ending, let's move on from the Innu. Let's move a little bit downstream along the St. Lawrence, pushing out towards the Atlantic Ocean. And we encounter another group of Algonquian people. A group from whom the story that opened this episode came from. The best I can pronounce their name is Mi'kmaq. That's the best I could do, so please forgive me. Commonly referred to by outsiders as the Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq are going to live in basically maritime Canada today, in the extreme uh, northern part of New England, predominantly Maine. And they called this land Mi'kmaqi. That's, again, my best pronunciation. Archaeologists and the Mi'kmaq uh, agree that they lived in this area, this general area, for thousands of years. And their Algonquian language wasn't very close to that of the Innu just next door. They actually had more linguistic ties to the natives to the south, the Wabanaki and the Abenaki, and all these other New England Native American tribes. And so there's a sharp cultural division between the Innu and the Mi'kmaq, that although there's a relation there, the Innu are much closer to the people to their west, and the Mi'kmaq are much closer to people to their south. So they kind of know they have some commonalities, but they also realize, well, there's a lot of other people who are much closer to us than you guys over there. Think about the division between, like, East and Western Europe. So you have Eastern Europe, you have Western Europe. And there are differences, very general differences, in the history and the culture and the linguistics of these two general areas. But then also you zoom out a little more and you realize, well, there is a general European culture also. Same here. You have Algonquians who live over here, Algonquians who live over there, and there are divisions within. They lived in similar structures to the Innu, wigwam, wiki up, whatever words you want to use for that. Their environment was a little bit warmer because in some ways they were a little bit uh, further south, but they were also closer to the Atlantic Ocean. And any large body of water is going to provide a little more heat than the arid, dry interior of a continent. Being a little further along the St. Lawrence, they became very quick to adopt European-style boats. In fact, when the first explorers show up, there's going to be a great Mi'kmaq chief who's already out there with a shallop, having purchased it from a private trader who was there years before. And even before this time, the Mi'kmaq had certain abilities on the Atlantic. They had certain ocean-going canoes that could be taken offshore quite a ways. They would hunt seals. They would hunt whales. And this is why they're uh, some of the first groups to encounter Europeans, because they were hanging right off the Atlantic coast. And like the Innu, they would have this cyclical style of life, where certain seasons, they would go down to the river or out to the ocean, and they would collect seafood. And then there would be certain seasons where you would do more hunting. But they would move around less than the Innu. So they had semi-permanent dwellings, territories that stayed tight throughout the year. And so their government was a little more elaborate. There's been a scholarly debate on the nature of the evolution of Mi'kmaq national government. And so the Mi'kmaq themselves would say that the form of government that they hold traditional has been their ruling style for a very long time, before European contact. But there are other scholars who, looking at the sources, have concluded that the outline of government that I'm about to talk about didn't quite coalesce at least not until the 17th century. And so, I'm not jumping into this debate. I'm just going to tell you the government that the Mi'kmaq themselves claim to have had before the Colombian era. Seven chiefs ran seven different districts inside of the Mi'kmaq world. The male heads of family would come together and vote within their districts on who would be their district chief. Now, in order to become a chief, you had to come from a lineage of a chiefly family. And these people selected to be chief, they were very proud of their lineage because it legitimized their position. And so they would remember these long strains of lineages going back dozens and dozens of generations, much like how a European king would have a guy working in an archive somewhere making sure his family tree was set in stone. Similarly to the Innu, this chief was expected to have multiple wives in order to accommodate for, again, the surplus of women and the scarcity of men, given the environment and the gender roles that were handed out to each group 
individually. These marriages again would extend your family and combine families and make the community stronger as a whole. And just like the Innu, other than these family bonds, the government rested lightly on the people, so to speak. And the power that a clan would have in the Iroquois world and the matrilineal influence through it did not exist to the extent uh, as they did in the Iroquois world as they did in the world of the Mi'kmaq. And so they did enjoy a personal freedom and ability to some level to move between clans and bands and different groups in different districts. Unlike the Iroquois, where chief titles were passed through the mother side of the family. The Mi'kmaq passed their titles preferably father to son. So it has more of a Western European method of transfer. But any man from the family of the former chief could inherit the title. But the Mi'kmaq were relatively self-sufficient. The environment was a little more hospitable than that of the Innu. And so each person could pretty much provide much of the needs for themselves once they reach adulthood or, or near even near adulthood. And so government was not a huge part of everyday life. Often the chiefs would become most important in times of hunting, organizing hunting parties, and war, organizing war parties. But other than that, the government kind of receded and let people go about living their lives. And also like the Innu, if you were a chief, you inherited certain responsibilities. A big one was you had to take care of the orphans. You were expected to provide or find a home for parentless children. And it was also expected that you would be leading the pack when it came time to go into war. You wouldn't be behind enemy lines, pointing fingers and shouting orders. You were to be right there. You were to be the toughest, the best, the fiercest and most brave warrior of the whole bunch. Now the chiefs of these seven districts would make up what was the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, a national council where they had a grand chief and a grand captain who would be the war chief for the entire nation. Despite having this grand chief, they still voted on things using the consensus system. That's not a popularity system. It's not a strictly a democratic system where the majority rules. The majority in this case would not be enough to pass a resolution. In the consensus system, everyone needs to come to an agreement. And the dissenting parties need to be convinced to come around and support something that maybe wasn't their first choice or second choice. This is a consensus system. And if a consensus is not met, a decision is not made. One version of this that you'll see in American politics is around primary season. When, in, when states, certain states don't have primaries, they have caucuses. I believe Iowa has the Iowa caucus. A caucus uses something like a consensus system. Now the Grand Council, despite having the word grand in its name, its powers were limited too. Commonly, they only dealt with a couple of issues to make sure everyone within the Mi'kmaq realm lived a happy and peaceful life. Of course, like the Haudenosaunee, one of their main concerns was preventing wars between members of this great council. And so internal disputes were settled at the Grand Council. Resolutions were made. And the primary thing that would cause disputes, other than blood feuds, which we've talked about this episode, is the distribution of hunting grounds. Now, this might as well be your grocery store, right? We don't have grocery stores back then. We have hunting grounds. If I said to you, hey, you can't go to the grocery store anymore that's near your house, because that's my grocery store. Well, them's fighting words pretty damn quick when your stomach starts to grumble. And so who would get to hunt where became a big deal. And who could judge over that with some level of impartiality without resorting to war? It would be the Grand Council. But now let's shift into the Mi'kmaq worldview, which will tie into that strange tale that started this episode. Of course, at the top of, of it all, at the beginning of it all, we have a great spirit. And the Mi'kmaq have a uh, notion of the great spirit similar to a Judeo-Christian god where the Great Spirit is beyond human form, a being greater than just having appendages and eyes and a couple senses and simple feelings and simple intellect. The Great Spirit has a uh, almost Hindu level of incomprehension to a small mortal being like you and I. This Great Spirit is the thing 
that made the heavens and the earth, and plucked a star from the Milky Way and brought it towards us to light and heat our planet. Both the sun and the moon were worshipped as tools of the Great Spirit, merely signs of the power this mysterious being had. From the earth, the Great Spirit made Gluskap, a heroic figure, mythical, demigod of sorts, whose name is pronounced many different ways, so please forgive me. The Great Spirit then used the sun and focused its rays on an old, craggly rock. And the rock started to steam and bubble, started to grow to life and expand. And soon the rock started to unfold and open up, and it was an old woman. Glooskap came upon the old woman and found that she was full of wisdom, knowledge that he had yet to have, and didn't know where to obtain on his own. He said to her, I want you to become my grandmother, and teach me all that you know. Although the woman was wise, she was limited in her abilities, due to her advanced age, and could only forage for small berries and other little vegetable bits. She said to Glooskap, I, I will be your grandmother, but I cannot go on living like this. I'm starving. If I am your grandmother, you must be my grandson and help me survive in this world. Glooskap was a great hunter and he could also communicate with animals. And so he went up to a marten and he said to the marten, will you sacrifice your life to sustain my grandmother? Surprisingly, the marten agreed to do so and Glooskap snapped his neck. Grandmother was then able to eat a good meal and feel strong and comfortable in this new world that she was in. But Glooskap felt sad because of that Martin. That Martin was so virtuous, it gave up its own life so that grandmother could simply be comfortable. So he prayed to the Great Spirit that somehow, beyond Glooskap's own powers, beyond his own sense of reasoning and logic, that the Martin's life would be restored to it. And sure enough, the Martin was returned to this world. Glooskap, the grandmother, and the Martin became a team together, and they went about the world exploring this new creation. They all found that fire became intricately important to their everyday lives. Fire warmed them, fire lit their way, fire prepared their food. Glooskap wished to bring fire into a living existence, into a being much like himself. And so as the sparks left his fire one night, he commanded them to become like him. Seven sparks became men. Seven sparks became women. Each pair became one of the seven divisions of the Mi'kmaq today. And so the Mi'kmaq were created by fire. And inside of each one of them glowed the word and intentions of the great Glooskap. But being made of fire, you have some disadvantages. Glooskap never dies, never grows old. A fire dims throughout time, grows cold. And so humans, too, would grow old. They would die, they would wither, and get sick, and dim away as any fire does. Glooskap could tame animals, he could speak to animals. Animals are afraid of fire. Animals became afraid of man. Glooskap could control the weather. Fire is controlled by the weather. And so humans, too, would be victims of the world around them if the spirits of nature decided to be malevolent towards them. It would be Glooskap who taught these figures of himself, these humans, how to live, how to get along with one another, teach them culture and music and spirituality and kindness. But he would never be able to extinguish the fire that created them and the fire that would take them under. After teaching humans to be like himself, he became a guardian to the human race. Over time, he could retreat out of view and change form, so humanity didn't know he was watching. He could deliver messages through animals. And yes, at times he would get bored, and he would become a trickster figure, play pranks on people. And all humans like to play pranks. And why is that? Because we all got it from Glooskap. Some of the Mi'kmaq believe that Glooskap has disappeared in the modern era. When the white man showed up from across the sea, they tried to kidnap him, being the physical specimen that he must have been. And so he decided to pack up his stuff and head to an unknown country, never to be seen again. 
But right at the very beginning, he set the example. Young men are to protect and listen to their elders. The elders are to impart wisdom and maintain the creature comforts of civility that the young often cast aside. Animals are to be respected and recognized for their value. And we were all created on purpose. We aren't an accident. There is a reason why you are here. And with that, we're ending our lovely creation story of the Mi'kmaq. If you enjoyed that story, go online. Go to the library. Find some more of these stories by the Mi'kmaq. They're great storytellers. We, they're on the level of the Norse or the ancient Greeks. And something about their stories are more uplifting in some ways. And I'll tell you why. Because the Norse and the Greek, the Greeks, are often fatalistic. They believe in fate. They believe no matter what a character does, ultimately the universe has your story in mind. Where the Mi'kmaq seem to see individuals as having quite a bit of free will. And through an individual's free will, the story of the unfolding creation and development of the universe is carried through. Many of them often have lessons and morals, but they're not like Aesop's fables, where it's, you know, they're hitting you right on the nose with it. During the Victorian era, a lot of European scholars went to the Mi'kmaq and they wrote down a lot of these stories because they, they too found them enjoyable. But if you read the older things, you'll find that they infused horses and swords and metal shields and they had knights and all these other things. So they actually obscured the original story with all this European verbiage as well as morality, let's say, and then, you know, just basic story tropes that came from Europe. So you might need to dig a little further back or go a little more recent and go to a contemporary Mi'kmaq community or author and see what they have to say about their own culture. They have stories with King Arthur-like figures. They have monsters like dragons. They have stories of conflicts between brothers. Sounds familiar? They have creatures like Gooseclap, who would be demigods or semigods or gods themselves in the old world, according to their definitions. They have stories of fights between conflicting systems of magic, almost like a Jedi versus Sith. Ugly duckling-like stories. They have, a, they have characters who become invisible at certain times, so there's sci-fi elements in there. They have giants marrying humans in stories, much like the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. And like many stories of the Bronze Age, brides won by fantastic, impressive feats of strength. Like the Norse, weapons and small objects can have personalities, spirits, names, a culture all their own, and a power that can be channeled through the human using it. Many of the recorded storytellers have been men in the past. So men are often the heroes. Old women are often wisdom and safety. They're the home. They're stability. Young women are almost always going to be trouble. But doesn't that just bring us back around to that first story? Not in this little chunk. The first story in the entire episode. The young woman who had the dream about the floating islands and those, those bears operating long sheets of white rabbit skin on trees. Which, if you didn't get the clue by now, would be the first appearances of Europeans on the horizon working large sailboats. Of course, there could be no interpreting this dream because the experience of the old world and the new world colliding was unprecedented. But there's one group which would serve as a warning for every native group west of them. Let's move out of the St. Lawrence, go into the Atlantic. Let's get off the North American continent to a very close nearby island called Newfoundland, or as they say in Newfoundland, Newfoundland. There before the arrival of the Europeans was a small native population known as the Beothuk. There's several ways to pronounce that, and that's how I'm deciding to do it. Newfoundland being very close to Greenland, and therefore Iceland, and fairly close to Europe compared to the rest of North America, would be the setting for many of the first, first contact experiences between the two halves of the world. It's thought that the Beothuk had interactions with the Norse as they expanded west across the Atlantic about a thousand years ago. There aren't too many specific details about this group, like with the other couple we looked at. They're even more mysterious than the St. Lawrence Iroquois. It's known that they were probably an Algonquian-speaking people. So their language was distantly, or very closely, 
related to Mi'kmaq and the Innu. It's known that they covered themselves in red ochre. And so they might actually be the origin of the Red Man label that Europeans will bestow upon the native population of the Americas. The entire culture just before contact is estimated to be only about 500 individuals. They exist as a sparse population on the very edge of the native world. Their diet depended greatly on seafood of all sorts. Fish, shellfish, seals, and there were deer on the island, which they hunted. They usually used harpoon on the seafood and bow and arrow on the deer. Much like their neighbors, they lived in wigwams. They created small snares to capture birds. And they made large canoes, barks even, to traverse the seas. In the cold winters of Newfoundland, they would actually dig underground and place their wigwams somewhat subterranean. And so uh, get a little of the natural heat coming from the earth itself. Post-contact, they quickly gained a reputation for avoiding outsiders altogether, hiding, being xenophobic. Some scholars believe it was because of their experience with the Norse. 100, 200, 300 years before other Europeans started showing up that soured their opinion of foreigners. However, they didn't need the Norse to create a bad impression of people from Europe. It is known that the Portuguese, really early on, enslaved many of them, capturing them off the coast, carrying them away in boats, never to return again. Now, wouldn't that send you packing for the hills? Newfoundland would be claimed by France and would be, according to them, part of New France for a while. But it was one of the earliest possessions that the English gained firm control over much of the island. But along the coast, there would be fishing stations belonging to many different nationalities of Europe. These would be seasonal. And so there'd be large parts of the year that these camps would be abandoned. The Beothuk, they could come down when everyone was gone and scavenge through the camp. And that's how they obtained metal. Every other native group is going to have to trade with the Europeans. They're going to have to work with and communicate with them in order to obtain metal, which will greatly improve their quality of life. The Beothuk simply wait for everyone to go home, and then they take whatever they want. As people started to move in permanently, there were trappers on the island, and the Beothuk would raid the traps. Why catch the food when somebody has already done it for you? The Mi'kmaq were also known to travel to the island to hunt. And slowly over time, these outside groups took up more and more of Newfoundland. And throughout the 18th century, there were brutal attacks on the Beothuk, and vice versa, as trappers tried to gain territory, secure their fines, and the Beothuk mainly trying to maintain their lifestyle. The French never sent missionaries to them, never tried to convert them. The Beothuk were not economically useful to anyone. And the same was true when the English rolled in and asserted power over the island. Everyone simply went past the Beothuk or saw them as an obstacle in their way. Eventually, the island became enclosed to the Beothuk, the shoreline being used up and they had to retreat inward. Of course, infectious diseases, which the small population, which had only been at most a thousand, I know I said 500 earlier, but some people estimate as high as a thousand, slowly began to be ebbed away by smallpox, typhoid, and a dozen other diseases that they'd never had before. Eventually, the Beothuk dwindled to individual members, less than 10. And on the island of Newfoundland, they became a I am legend-like creature that lived in the woods. Mysterious. People doubted they even existed. And so in the 1820s, the new inhabitants went into the interior of the island to see who's left. Do they exist? Had, did they ever exist? They found a couple, a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. The husband tried desperately to protect the woman. The Europeans wanted to capture them like specimens, like Bigfoot like the Ice Man, like the Loch Ness Monster. But the Beothuk couldn't have known that their intentions were anything less than malignant. The woman's husband died protecting her, and the Europeans seized the last of the Beothuk. Eventually, some level of communication was attained between this last member of the Beothuk and the Europeans who had captured her. They recorded her name as 
Shonarithet, and she identified herself as the final member of her tribe, the man who tried to protect her being her husband, and her close family having died not too long before from the same infectious diseases we've mentioned before. She lingered for some time, having no one, and died of tuberculosis in 1829. At this point in time, many scholars say that the Beothuk went extinct. And so even to this day, we don't exactly talk about the Beothuk like they're humans, because species go extinct. And she was a human being. She was just like you. But it is true that culturally, the Beothuk are dead. They are gone. There isn't one member left. However, the Innu, the Mi'kmaq, and recent research by scientists have uncovered a bit about the Beothuk genome. And they believe that there are descendants of this tribe alive in Canada and the United States. Although the genes watered down, of course, and the identity of Beothuk completely absent. How could that young Mi'kmaq woman know what her dream meant? There was absolutely nothing preparing the natives for what was about to happen. Welcome to the story of New France. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.